All right, page 307 in your textbooks. You had questions 7 through 11 to complete for homework last night. Page 307, question 7 through 11 as we continue looking through this chapter on the refraction of light. And Kendall, hope you get feeling better, able to rejoin us on Monday. Question number 7. State the two laws of refraction. Um, Michael, what did you have for number seven? The two laws of refraction are the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflectance uh, and the incident ray, the normal, and the refracted ray all lie in the same plane. You're right about the second law. The incident ray, the refracted ray, and the normal all lie in the same plane, but the angle of incidence does not equal the angle of refraction. If it did, there would not be refraction. We mentioned that yesterday. Audrey, what did you have for the first law of refraction? I had the equation of n sub 1 sine Yeah, that, that equation is the first law of refraction. If you wanted to put it in words, you would say that the um, index of refraction for the first medium times the sine of the incident angle equals the index of the product of the incident uh, 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 refractive index for the second medium times the angle of sine of the angle of refraction. The, the equation is the law. Snell's law is the first law of refraction. Um, so when it says state, that's kind of hard, but no, the two angles are not equal specifically. Uh, number eight, explain why the sun can be seen below the horizon, Michael. The sun can be seen below the horizon because the shimmer effect puts it one diameter above its actual position. There we go. The, the light literally refracts through our atmosphere, right? You've got the vacuum of space. Right now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But anyway, we'll save it for when we get to the lesson. Yes, we'll just go with yes. Number nine, why do boatmen judge depth by dropping a line into the water rather than by looking at the water bottom? Audrey. Boatmen judge depth by dropping a line into the water rather than by looking at the water bottom because light passing from air to water and then back to air is refracted twice and your brain spots a different place of origin for the image when the light's refracted at every surface. I assume you copied that. Yeah. That was a very good answer. Um, did you understand any of that? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Yeah, Bessie, you're, you, you know your vocabulary very well. You've been doing it Becca for a while, so you got that. Good. That is very, very thorough. Um, I was just going to say, like, the way the light refracts back out of the water makes it look like the bottom somewhere it ain't. But yours is very good, very well stated. Uh, number 10, <laughs> what is the term for the angle? I say that was copied. It actually wouldn't have shocked me if you came up with that yourself either, but I'm pretty sure that was copied. <laughs> number 10, what is the term for the angle at which light undergoes total internal reflection? And is this angle in the first medium or the second medium, Michael? The critical angle is the angle at which light undergoes total internal reflection, and it happens in the second medium. Ah, uh, it is in the first medium. The critical angle is in the first. And the refra yeah, so. Uh, number 11. What conditions are necessary for total internal reflection? Audrey. Some conditions necessary for total internal reflection are the angles of incidence must be greater than 90 degrees of the critical angle, and light must come to a boundary of a medium of lower density. Okay, good. I'm going to tweak your first answer. The incident angle must be greater than the critical angle. You mentioned 90 degrees, that's actually the minimum refracted angle, so, but it must be greater than the critical angle, and yes, that can only happen if you have a high, lower optical density for the second medium, higher optical density in the first. Good. All right, we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. For now, let's go and review this term, optical density. There were two definitions. There was the textbook definition, the transparent material's resistance to the transmission of light rays, which is how Audrey would like to state it, <laughs> frankly. And then there's the um, down home, we in the south, let's just talk so we understand it. Michael, do you remember the uh, way I explained optical density? How easy a window light can pass through an object. Mm, that's actually not that bad, um, though it, it takes it from a positive perspective where optical density could be viewed more from a negative. Ability to slow down light. What is optical density class? Ability to slow down. Higher optical density is a greater ability to slow down light. So if you slow light a lot, high, well, if something, not you, you're opaque. If something slows down light a lot, I am. Hey, I am. <laughs> anyway, there's a bug on your back. <laughs> I digress. Um, uh, if light slows down a great deal going through a medium, it's got a high optical density. If it doesn't slow down much at all, it's got a low optical density. Um, when we said that light changes speed, when light slows down, when any wave, for that matter, slows down, or when any wave speeds up, 
what happens to the wave, or specifically in this chapter, what happens to the light, Michael? It bends. It bends. It changes direction, or the word, the technical term is? It refracts. It refracts. Good. Now, if the light slows down, maybe the light is racing through the vacuum of space, and it gets to our atmosphere, which has gases and moisture, right, water vapor in it, and um, as it reaches that higher optical density, it slows down. When it slows down, it refracts in which direction? Toward, Toward the normal. Whereas if light were to be, uh, for instance, maybe we've got uh, you know, pools. It might have lights in the bottom of them for nighttime swimming or something. Okay, when the light, now if you're directly over the light, it's coming along the normal. There won't be any refraction, right? But if you're looking at the light from an angle, the light's traveling from water, a higher optical density, to where you are, lower optical density. And so you would get this, um, this refraction as the light speeds up. It's going to refract, Audrey, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. away from the normal. So for instance, um, water, floor of pool, pool light. That's light. <clears throat> Edge of pool. You, looking at light, okay? So the light ray is coming towards your eye, but as the light ray is coming up here, right, here's the normal, here's the angle of incidence. The light has to refract class away from the normal. So if it kept going on its current trajectory, that would be no refraction. It pushes away from the normal. Maybe it's a little exaggerated there, but it's gonna refract away from the normal. So that what you're seeing isn't actually these rays. It appears it's shifted in its location. Uh, appears like it's higher up, usually. And um, so that refraction takes place as away from the normal as the light speeds up. Again, as light slows down, it refracts toward the normal. If I were to compare the speed of light in some medium to the speed of light in a vacuum, or rather vice versa, make the ratio of speed of light in a vacuum, represented class by the letter C. C, to the speed of light, V, in some medium, V sub M. That ratio is how we define the... Mm -hmm. Comparing the speeds. Light at its fastest speed to light at the speed it's actually traveling through this medium. That ratio is called the, you can look now, refractive, refractive index or index of refraction. We'll represent index of refraction or refractive index with the letter mm -hmm. N. So we say that N sub M, the refractive index of some medium, equals that ratio of speed of light in the vacuum to speed of light in the medium. For our purpose, we, we will say the speed of light in the vacuum is? 3.00 EA or 3 E8 meters per second. Um, we'll assume the three sig fix from the 3.00. Again, the V sub M will be whatever the index of refraction or the speed of light through that substance. We saw in the video at the end of the hour yesterday, uh, light travels through Wesson oil or Instaglass at a certain speed and travels through the borosilic Pyrex class at a certain speed, pretty much the same speed. So as light goes through there, remember we said when light hits a window, for instance, from air, that's different optical densities. Sunlight reflects off, hence we see the glass pane, sunlight goes through. But if somehow the two substances had the exact same refractive index, light just goes right through, nothing's reflected off, so we don't see it. The light went right through, except for, you could tell where the beaker was when you put it back in the second time, because of the bubbles. Because bubbles are air, air's a different optical density. We could see that then, right? So kind of an interesting, uh, interesting video there. If I uh, were cooler and didn't care about making messes in here, I would have done the demonstration myself, but <laughs> you already did a video on it, so I'm lazy. I'm gonna buy beakers to break and buy a whole bunch of Wesson oil and make messes everywhere and have to clean them up, so let him clean them up. Anyway, that's what happens when you get a lazy physics teacher. Um, questions on index of refraction, all that stuff we talked about yesterday. All right, first law of refraction. First law of refraction, and I will not put it in words. <laughs> As you already saw when I was explaining it earlier in the homework, there's a reason why we're not gonna do words for first law of refraction. You do need to know that the first law of refraction is known as Snell's law. Named after Little Lord Schnell, I think it was a Dutchman. I think like a German accent on there. They're not terribly different. I believe the book says where he's from. I think he's Dutch. Yeah, Dutch. Little Lord Schnell and uh, Snell. And this we call it Snell's Law. Then he found that if you take the refractive index of the first medium 
and refractive index of the second mean. The refractive indices affect the angles of, reflection, of refraction. So, but it's related by the sine of the angle. So we take the sine of the incident angle and the sine of the refracted angle, and the sines of the angles are related by the refractive indices. So we get the equation n1 times the sine of theta sub i equals n2 times the sine of theta sub r. Again, 1 is the first medium, 2 is the second medium, because the incident ray is in the first medium and the refracted ray is in the second. You're looking for these words. Passes to, uh, from something into something. The from is the first and the into is the second. Now, the only reason I mention this is because sometimes you'll see a problem like this. Water passes into, or air, a little bit of light passes into water from air. What's the first medium? It's the air, because it came from the air and went into the uh, water. So it doesn't necessarily mean the first one that's mentioned in a problem, the second one that's mentioned in the problem, but rather, what is it traveling from? What is it traveling into or through? Does that make sense? All right, so uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some example problems here. And by the way, put a star next to that. That's the second equation you need to know for this chapter. Obviously, the uh, index of refraction equation, n equals c over v sub m. Here's your second one, Snell's law, the first law of refraction. Go ahead and read example 20.2. We're on page 295 now. Page 295, read that problem, example 20.2. Audrey. A light ray moving through the air falls on the flat surface of a bank of quartz. The angle, the angle of incidence is 30 degrees. What is the angle of refraction? All right, the light was traveling through what first class? Air. It was going through the air, so I'm going to write air over here, and it goes into the block of quartz. quartz. All right? And so my n sub 1 needs to be the refractive index of air. We'll look across the page, and you'll see the refractive index of air on that table of refractive indices. 1.0003. 1.0003. And we tell you the sign of the incident angle. Do they tell us the incident angle? Yes, 30 degrees. 30 degrees. Then we come to quartz. Well, look back at the table of refractive indices. What is the refractive index for quartz? And it's asking for the refracted angle, so we'll just plug in the numbers. 1.0003 times the sine of 30 degrees equals 1.46 times the sine of theta sub r. Straightforward plugging it in. Again, just don't get the two sides mixed up. From here, we plug this into the calculator. Take the sine of the 30, which you might already have memorized to be one half. <laughs> Not that you don't have to, right? And Kendall's like, what? It's from pre-cal, Kendall. Don't worry about it. Um, but you take the sine of 30, multiply it by the 1.0003, and then, once you've got this number, we can work on getting the theta sub r by itself. What do I do over here? Divide the 1.46 first. Get rid of that first. So we've got this value over here. Divide now by the 1.46. And finish by getting rid of the sine. This is the sine of theta sub r. We just want theta sub r. So Kendall, this is something that you haven't done a lot of this year because you aren't in pre-cal. To get rid of the sine, we take the second function of sine. On your calculator, it's arc sine. So we'll take the arc sine over here. That gets rid of it. Now, Michael, you've got a direct entry calculator. I suppose you could do this first. I think it's easier to just do this times this, divided by this, get your answer, and then take the arc sine of the answer, but it's up to you. What do we get for the refracted angle when it's all said and done, class? 20.03. 20 is that right? 20.034, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, we are going to round to uh, three sig figs, so it does round to 20.0 degrees. When you get your answer, stop and think about your answer. Because if you mess something up, you're going to catch it if you just think about it. Light's going from air into quartz. Which one's more optically dense? Quartz. quartz. So it should travel slower through the quartz, correct? If the light is slowing down, it's going to bend toward the normal, meaning you'll have a smaller angle. Yep, it checks. Does that make sense how to think that through? Just think, is it speeding up or slowing down? So should the angle be bigger or smaller? Does that jive with what I actually got? 
And if not, then it means you probably put the uh, refracted indices in the wrong spot or the angle in the wrong spot. Does that make sense? Look at the next example, example 20.3. Read this one for us, if you would, Michael. If light traveling through glass with a refractive index of 1.55 comes to a boundary at an angle at 24.2 degrees and escapes from the air, what is the angle of refraction? All right, what's the first medium the light is traveling through, class? Glass. It's going through glass, all right? So it's starting off in the glass. It travels through the glass into something else. They use the word through a lot. I, I tend to use the word from, but whatever. It's going from in glass, and it travels into the air. Now, it's very possible, by the way, that the light traveled through air in the first place. By the way, this would kind of be, imagine a very thick pane of glass, just so we can see it. And imagine then the light coming in at an angle with respect to the glass. So this is air, glass, and air again. What is going to happen when light travels from air into the glass? It's going to refract toward the normal, right? So you're going to get the angle cut in a little bit. So here's your theta i, here's your theta r, right? But then that ray is going to hit the glass again, isn't it? And so now we've got another normal here. What's going to happen to the ray? It's going to go away from the normal. What's interesting is when it goes away from the normal, now there's the theta r, there's the theta i. These two angles have to be equal. These angles end up being equal also. So it has the appearance, the illusion of going right through the glass. Okay? So that's why a pane of glass doesn't really bother you when you look through an ordinary pane of glass like that, because you're getting the same refractive indices on the opposite sides. You'll get a little reflection, so you'll lose a little bit of the light that's passing through, because there's a little reflection to it, but some of the light rays, but it passes through relatively undisturbed because the angles work the same way. Um, for now, though, we're ignoring what happened previously. We just have the light going through the glass and then into the air. So, index of refraction, does it tell us the glass's index of refraction? Because there's all different types of indices for glass. 1.55. Okay, so this particular glass is a 1.55 glass. Does it give us the incident ray or the incident angle? 24.2 mm -hmm. degrees? Yes. All right, with respect to the normal. Air, of course, we might remember from doing it in the last problem. 1.003. And once again, they're looking for the refractive angle, correct? Mm -hmm. At your seats, plug it into the calculator. 1.55 times the sine of the 24.2, divide the 1.003, and then at the end, take the arc sine, or the second function sine. And uh, what do we get for our angle of refraction, class? 39.4. 39.43, let's go three six and just say 39.4 degrees. Now, again, if it goes from glass into air, we should expect the light to be speeding up, correct? Which means it should go away from the normal, so we should get the bigger angle, and we do. Questions on this example problem? All right, look at the last example problem on the page. Read example 20.4, Audrey. Um, light traveling through water comes to a glass surface at an angle of incidence of 48.5 degrees. If the angle of refraction is 48.5 degrees, what is the index of refract refraction of the glass? All right, so starting out, it starts by going through water, water and it goes into glass. glass. Which do you think has a higher refract? Which do you think is more optically dense, water or glass? Water. Mm. Yeah. Which which could you go through easier? <laughs> you go through water easier. The same is true of, of um, light as well in most instances. Usually, glass is the more optically dense, and water will be slightly less optically dense. Both of them are more optically dense than air, though. It's going from water into glass. All right. Um, water is on your chart. For on the table of refractive indices. What is water's refractive index? 1.33. Does it give you the incident angle? 48.5. It's incident at 48.5 degrees? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, did it give you the refractive index for the glass? Because again, there's lots of different types of glass. 48. Oh, so we must be finding that refractive index then, correct? That's what it tells us to find. And that's times the sine of, it must give us the refracted angle then. 38.5. 38.5. By the way, notice something. What happened to the angle? 
It got smaller, which means it bent or refracted toward the normal, closer to the normal, which means the light must have slowed down, which means there must be a higher refractive index, a higher optical density. Does that make sense? So we're expecting something bigger than 1.33 is what I'm saying. And again, usually glass is right around that 1.5 number, somewhere in that neighborhood. All right, for this one, we don't need an arc sign, do we? We just multiply the 1.33 times the sine of 48.5, divide by not 38.5, but divide by the sine of 38.5. Kendall, when you enter this, you'll multiply, again, on your calculator, 48.5 sine times 1.33 divided by, as this comes over here in the denominator, 38.5 sine equals. And uh, what do we end up getting here for this refractive index, Michael? You get 1.6. Even? 001. 1.6001, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so a little higher than most of the other glass. Um, I got three sig figs, so 1.60. For this particular glass, it's refractive index. Do we get that as well? All right, Kendall, if you're having trouble with the calculator, let me know. Um, but hopefully, we kind of got the calculator side figured out. I want you to turn over to page 307 now. Page 307. I want you to do problem number three. Page 307, problem number three. Practice using Snell's Law on your own now. optically dense crystal, by the way. Um, so this kind of crystal would be lousy in jewelry. <laughs> um, we've got light going from the air class, that refractive index. 1.0003. And it says it's incident at 50 degrees. Refractive index of the crystal, they say, is 1.25. And they wanted you to find the uh, angle of refraction. You plug it in, 1.0003 times 50 sine equals, and we divide it with 1.25, take the arc sine. What angle of refraction do we get? 37.80. Good, 37.80, blah, blah, blah. That at least three say fix everywhere, so we'll say approximately 37.8 degrees. Did we get that answer? Again, that is a smaller angle, which means the light refracted toward the normal as the light had to slow down, right? Bent in toward the normal as it slowed down. Question is number three. Feeling pretty good about Snell's Law. All right, one more, and then we'll move on to problem number four. Light is passing from air into water. Again, the wavelength is a moot point. Angle of refraction, 16 degrees. You're finding the angle of incidence. Start with Snell's law class. Say it with me as I write it. N1 times the sine of theta sub i equals N2 times the sine of theta sub r. 
And so we take Ayer's refractive index class. We are finding the incident ray, the incident angle, so we're going to leave the theta sub i. We had to look up water, though we've used it a few times. You might have remembered it. Anyone actually remember it before looking it up? Just curious. All right, and then the, uh, the refracted angle, it said, was 16 degrees. We have 16.0. We'll take the sine of 16.0 degrees. This time we're going to start on this side. Multiply these two values, divide out the 1.003, finish by taking the arc sine. By the way, what's going to happen as the air goes into the as the light goes into the water class? It's going to because it is slowing down, right? So we would expect it to bend toward the normal, but this is a smaller angle. The answer we get then should be a larger angle. Make sense? So. Um, What did we get for that? And it's not much larger, actually. What did we get for that incident angle? 21.499. We had 21.499, or pretty much exactly 21.5 degrees. Almost exactly 21.5 degrees. Do we get that for the incident angle? Any questions at all? All right, let's move on then. Looking in your books, page 296. Flip back to page 296. Second law of refraction. Sounds a lot like the second law of reflection, and that is that... Uh, the incident ray, the normal, and the refracted ray all lie in the same plane. And that stands to reason. The incident ray, refracted ray, and the normal all lie in the same plane. Light doesn't, doesn't suddenly go shooting off in a direction of its own. It stays in the same plane it starts. Another thing that's rather interesting, imagine in the previous problem, maybe I shouldn't have erased it, if we just reversed the two sides, we said, well, what if it starts in the water with a 16 degree angle of incidence? What would be the refracted ray in the air? Well, that would be the 21.5. The angles stay the same, the two angles, because again, if the, if the ratio of the refracted indices is the same, and one of the two angles is the same, the other angle has to be the same. We call this the principle of reversibility. You don't need to write it down, just kind of note the illustration of it there. But if water passes from air into glass, and you see the refraction, then if water were to go from glass into air, taking the refracted angle as the incident angle, then the incident angle in the air would be the refracted angle in the air the second time. So it follows the same path, um, is the point, no matter which direction it's going from. Some interesting effects of refraction. One of them was asked in the homework about um, being able to see the sun before it actually comes up, and still seeing the sun even after it has technically fully set. We refer to sunrise as when the sun rises above the horizon, but you can actually see the sun before it rises, can't you? Um, the book shows the illustration there of the sun's rays coming in respective to the horizon, but because of the refraction effects, the refraction toward the normal of light rays hitting our atmosphere, they're bent down to earth before the sun actually comes up. So it looks like the sun's above the horizon before it really is. Something else you may have noticed if you've ever been driving as the sun was rising, what color does, you're not supposed to look at the sun, but what color does the sun appear to be as it's first rising? A really bright reddish orange, sometimes almost a pinkish orange, right? Same thing happens at sunset. That's dispersion effects, that's chapter 21, but that's kind of that prismatic effect, right, of you know, catching that uh, low frequency end of the spectrum as it's coming in. So we get that, that refra or, uh, diffraction effect of light as well. Um, but uh, and you can see it before it actually comes up. You can see it for another couple minutes after it goes down. Usually only about two minutes difference there. Um, mirages. Um, anyone ever been driving along the road, maybe the highway, the interstate in Georgia, anywhere in the south, and it looks like there's puddles of water on the road until you get there, right? Well, really what you're seeing is a reflection right, we, we, or what appears to be a reflection, right? If we actually had water and there were a mountain on one side of the water, what we can see is that same reflection, correct? And so we can tell there's water there because we see the same thing above and below. Well, you get that effect of what you see in front appears to be reflected back because of, as you know in your book, that refraction effect. As the, uh, the cooler air is higher up, light rays bend because of the hot surface of the road, bend back upward towards you, and so it looks like there's a second image. You see Michael, 
and you see a reflection of light. Well, it's not really a reflection, it's a refraction effect. And so it looks like there must be a puddle of water there for me to be able to see Michael down below Michael. But it's simply a refraction effect of light. So kind of interesting there. So the next time you're driving on the hot roadway, you're like, it's a refraction of light. That's what it is. And so anyway, <laughs> um, interesting there. Water depth, right? It looks like the bottom's higher than it really is because of the way light refracts. We see that diagram there on page 297. Better than my diagram of it, at least. Um, so, again, you assume when you see something, you assume you're seeing a straight line, right? So that's why it looks like the feet are in a certain place, because you assume what I'm seeing must travel in a straight line, but actually the feet are further down. They look like they're higher up because of the refraction effect of light. Um, again, this is one of the reasons why you always dive feet first, never head first, right? Um, you've heard the story of Joni Erickson Todd, of the artist who draws with her mouth, and she dove head first into a lake that she thought was deeper than it was, severed her spine and paralyzed from the waist down. We don't want that to be you. Um, image reversal. We're going to talk about this when we get to lenses a little bit more, but that glass of water in figure 20.9 is basically functioning as a lens, and so it reverses the image around. By the way, you remember uh, anyone that watched National Treasure? Okay? Remember when he looks through the water bottle, uses a magnifying glass to see the time? They goofed. It should have reversed the image, and it didn't. Mm -hmm. That was all fake. Mm -hmm. All right, but anyway, it was cool in the movie, at least. I thought the movie was cool. And you learn a little history in the movie. You know, there may have been a little fake news in there as well, but it was cool. All right? Great movie. Great movie. Um, anyway. A uh, glass of water, the double image, you're seeing two different places of refraction. You're seeing refraction of the glass and at the surface of the water. Just some really cool stuff that refraction helps to explain. And again, if we go back to chapter 18, this is all stuff William Herschel had noted, which is why he said, hey, all this refraction going on, light's got to be a wave, right? Just the vacuum problem, right? But uh, again, thank you, Einstein, for fixing that for us. Questions on refraction of light? Any questions on that? There's one more really neat effect. We're actually going to look at this in class. So, Kendall, hopefully you're back with us Monday because we've got some cool stuff to look at Monday. Um, I'll put some videos up for those watching on YouTube. It won't be as cool as seeing it in class, but you'll see some videos of kind of what we'll be doing in the classroom. Um, I want to talk about this next thing, that's total internal reflection. I'm going to write that down in your notes. Total internal reflection. Total internal reflection occurs when light rays attempt to travel. Total internal reflection occurs when light rays attempt to travel from a medium of high optical density. Total internal reflection occurs when light rays attempt to travel from a medium of high optical density to low technically to lower optical density, but we're too lazy to write that. So travel from high optical density to low, but are reflected back into the first medium. Occurs when light rays attempt to travel from a medium of high optical density to low, but are instead reflected back into the first medium. Or instead reflected back into the first medium. Well, let's put it this way. We've got this first substance. This is high optical density, so light is traveling slow. And there is low optical density, oftentimes air. So this could be a glass. This could be, uh, this could be water even. Right? We'll use water for our demonstration. But we've got a light ray. Now, of course, if the light ray is traveling straight up along the normal, it will travel straight up. There's no refraction whatsoever. But if the light ray travels at an angle with respect to the normal, the light ray is going to not refract at this angle, but at a slightly greater angle. If you increase this angle, you will thereby increase that one. Increase this angle more, you'll increase that angle more. Until eventually, if you get a big enough angle, the refracted ray could skim the surface or could refract so far, it actually stays in that first medium. The exact incident angle needed to exactly produce 90 degree refraction is called the critical angle. Write that term in your notes. The critical angle 
is the incident angle required to get a 90 degree angle of refraction. The incident angle required to produce a 90 degree angle of refraction. We call it the critical angle. The critical angle, the incident angle required to produce a 90 degree angle of refraction. Now realize that if you were to go any bigger than the critical angle, that refraction effect in a sense pushes the angle back into that first medium. What realistically happens is at the boundary, remember we said at a boundary some light will reflect, some light will refract. Well, at this angle, all the light just reflects. And so whatever this angle is, that angle is. So you get this reflection effect. Um, the light never even escapes. So light's escaping straight up. It's bending, 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 bending. Now it's going to skim that surface. Bigger angle, and the light just reflects back in. Now, we're, we'll talk about this again on Monday, but this is the principle that fiber optics use as these electromagnetic rays, or light rays in many instances, you want to think of like fiber optic Christmas tree, we're literally just using light, but the fiber optics basically have such a high optical density fiber that as the light rays pass through them, they bounce around inside the fiber. They can't escape into the air around it. And so the, all of the light that's pushed in one end of the fiber stays in the fiber until it comes out the other end. So that's basically the principle. We're going to look at a similar illustration of that. What we're going to do with water. Um, it's not going to be quite as impressive, of course, but we're going to look at that with water in the, in the next lesson. But this critical angle gives you 90 degree angle of refraction. Greater angles, if you write this down, a greater incident angle than the critical angle actually results in total internal reflection. A greater angle of incidence than the critical angle if theta sub i is greater than theta sub c, might be a good way to put it in the notes. If theta sub i is greater than theta sub c, you will get total internal reflection. The light will not escape into the second medium. It will stay in the first medium. We're going to talk also on Monday about how diamonds keep trap light in them, keep it bouncing around the faces of the diamond for a while, producing more and more sparkle every time. So. We'll look at that as well in our next lesson. Kind of running out of time here. I do want to show this though. Remember Snell's law. If you were to take the incident or the uh, first medium's refracted index of refraction times the sine of the incident angle, that'll equal the index of refraction of the second medium times the sine of the refracted angle. For the critical angle, we said the critical angle is the incident angle that produces a 90 degree angle of refraction. Well, that means that n1 times the sine of theta sub c equals n2 times, oh, what's the sine of 90? 1. Thinking 0, 90, 90 triangle, thinking uh, the unit circle. Kendall, just take my word for it, the sine of 90 is 1. Or you can plug it in your calculator. 90 degrees sine. Hey, that is 1. Since this is 1, anything times 1 is itself, the sine of the 90 just drops out. Therefore, I could then divide away the refractive index of the first medium, and we get the next equation for you to write in your notes. The sine of the critical angle equals n2 over n1. Now remember, the critical angle can only exist if you're going from high density. This has got to be the high density number into low density. Light is being trapped in the high density material, whether that's glass, diamond as we talked about, water, fiber optic cable, whatever. The high density is the first medium. The low density is the second medium. That's important because if you get it flip-flopped, you're going to have big divided by small, which gives you an improper fraction, which gives you something over one. And when you try to take the arc sign of something bigger than one, it says error. That's the good news. The saving grace is your calculator will prevent you from screwing this up. If you plug in the numbers backwards, your calculator says error. The only way it can work is if you plug it in correctly. But the low density second medium goes over the first density, high, first medium, higher density, divide, take the arc sign to get your critical angle. Look at the example problem on page 298. Look at the example problem on page 298. 
Go ahead and read that for us, if you would, Audrey. As the light ray passes through a glass prism surrounded by water, the ray strikes the boundary at 45 degrees and undergoes total internal reflection. What is the index of refraction of the glass? They're kind of suggesting to us that the theta sub c, that critical angle, is the 45 degrees. They're suggesting that it begins total internal reflection at a 45 degree angle. So they said, well, if uh, 45 degrees is the theta sub c, and if the first medium is the prism, that's the glass, that's the unknown, and the second medium is water, that's 1.33, to solve for the glass, we could simply alternate. We could say n1 equals the 1.33 over the sine of 45 degrees. And so if you plug that into the calculator, we get what for the glass's refractive index? This is very high density for glass. Yeah, there's a side of the point is there actually a glass with a refractive index this high? That's, that's almost where cubic zirconia is. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's a special type of glass. But 1.88 would be that refractive index. But again, you just plug in what you know. I know the refractive index of the second medium, the water the light's trying to go into and can't, is 1.33. The critical angle is 45. First medium's refractive, uh, refractive index would be the 1.88. Or it could be even larger. Questions on that? All right, we'll pick that up next time. Homework for this evening, or for the weekend, I should say, is, Kendall, first of all, get better. Second of all, read pages 300 to 304. Read pages 300 to 304. On page 307, answer questions 14 through 17. On page 307, answer questions 14 through 17. And on page 308, do problems 5, 6, and 8. Page 308, problems 5, 6, and 8. And have a wonderful rest of your day. You are dismissed.